That is always a fun song. <laughs> Our scripture reading for this morning are two lessons from Luke chapter 17 and 1 John chapter 2. In Luke, Jesus says these words. As he entered a certain village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him, and they raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourself to the priests. And it came about as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus ans answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who turned back to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. And then a second reading from 1 John. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the payment for our sins, and not only for, for ours, but also for the whole world. This is the word of God for the people of God. Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we are going through this series of messages about live to give, we come to the topic of giving thanks. That should be sel pretty self-explanatory for we who are God's people because we are known to be a thankful people. The reason for that is we attribute every blessing of life as a gift from God's hand to us and we express gratitude back to God for all that we have. But unfortunately, that is not the case for most people in the world something that you can see readily in the life and ministry of Jesus. We see that attitude of thanklessness in the lives of so many he interacts with. In actuality, there are really only three different attitudes you can have with regard to Thanksgiving. Just three. And I want to share all three with you this morning. And then we need to spend a little time reflecting and asking ourselves, where do I fit in? Where do I fit in in these attitudes about Thanksgiving? So bear with me for a minute as we go through these three. 
The first attitude toward thanksgiving is that it's not necessary. And we live in a world filled with people who think that giving thanks or gratitude to God especially is unnecessary. And the reason for that is they truly believe that they themselves, by their own power and their own abilities, have been able to accomplish and acquire everything they have all by themselves, and therefore there's no need to give thanks to God or anyone else. Jesus helps us understand this in the words of this parable. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods for many years. Relax. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool. This night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. See, the farmer was presumptuous about his future prosperity just as he had been ungrateful for his past success. He believed that he was able to obtain all that he had and there was no one he needed to give thanks to or trust in beyond his own self and his abilities. The words of judgment spoken in the parable testified to the fact that this man was powerless to hold on to what he had obtained just as he had been powerless to produce it. The Lord gave and the Lord took away. The attitude of unthankfulness that is not necessary is worse than ingratitude. The attitude that thinks is not necessary is blatant unbelief. It does not acknowledge God at all. In fact, it is this attitude that we see so prevalent in the world today. Not ingratitude, just there is no need to think anyone. The second attitude about thanksgiving is that of the hypocrite. We see it again in the teachings of Jesus where he lays this out for us to understand a hypocritical understanding of thanksgiving. Jesus tells this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying to himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adul adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven and was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus tells us that the Pharisee was praying to himself. That gives us insight into the man's heart. He was invoking God's name, but he was really praying to himself about himself. He was not acknowledging God's presence in his life. He was using the name of God in his prayers to undergird his sins of false piety for the world to see. And his real point was he looked at those around him and was praising himself that he was better than other people. And because God was not central in his prayers, his prayer was worthless. He was not acceptable before God. The text says the tax collector went down to his home justified. The Pharisee did not. And Jesus is warning us about this attitude of hypocrisy, even where we would invoke God's name in thanksgiving, but not in sincere thankfulness to him when the focus is all about us and not about God. The third attitude of thanksgiving, having looked at that it's unnecessary and that of the hypocrite, is an attitude of true thankfulness to God. This is the person who understands that everything that you are and everything that you have is a gift from God and you are totally dependent upon God for everything. And that is a heart that will, that will truly give thanks to God. 
We see it in the life of Jesus all the time as he's ministering to people. People respond in thanksgiving to Jesus and in thanksgiving and praise to the Father for all that Jesus does. The parable of the story, not parable, the story was read just a moment ago, the story of the ten lepers. Jesus is entering a village, and of course leprosy was a horrid disease, and we used to have leper colonies. Hawaii, I think, was a leper colony at one time, uh, you know, where we would we'd send these people away because it was so contagious, no cure, so deadly, and such a horrible disease. These lepers stood at a distance and cried out to Jesus for mercy. You notice what he does? No hocus pocus, no, you know, big pomp and circumstance or show or anything. He simply says, go show yourselves to the priests. These two men take off heading toward Jerusalem to go into the city and show themselves to the priests. And as they're walking, somehow, miraculously, their leprosy, this disease, is cured immediately, step by step as they walk. They see they're healed. And one of them realizing his heel turns and makes a beeline back to Jesus, falls on the ground at his feet and praises God for the healing he's received. That is the thankfulness of a believer, a truly thankful heart of someone who trusts in God. But Jesus is surprised. Where are the other nine? Weren't all ten healed? Nine of the people called out to Jesus, asked for the blessings of God, but they were really only focused on themselves. They got what they wanted and went on without giving any thanks. And sometimes that's a danger that we all fall into, that we cry out to God for the things we think we want or need or in the midst of some crisis, God grants it to us, and then we fail to respond in thankfulness to God. But the Samaritan, Jesus looks at him, and what does he say? Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. You see, the Samaritan sought healing for his body, but he also sought it for the glory of God. And when God had granted his healing, he was ready and willing to thank God for everything that he had because he knew that he and his life was totally dependent upon Jesus and his grace. He was going to die, but Jesus saved him. And being totally dependent upon his grace... It was what moved him to have a heart of thankfulness for God. And so I have to ask you at this point, where do you see yourself? Where do you fall into the scope of these three attitudes toward thanksgiving? Are you, do you find yourself at times with those who see no need to give thanks? Have you been deceived, as so many have, into believing that you have the ability, the power by your own will and intellect and ability to accomplish everything that you desire and everything that you want you can gather for yourself and you have no need to thank anyone? Because it's easy to fall into that trap, to be deceived. Or maybe you find yourself standing with the Pharisees. Maybe you stand and look around at other people and think, well, I'm better than they are. My spirituality is much stronger than theirs is. It's so easy to fall into the trap of the Pharisees and believe that our position, our standing before God, is based on the fact that we're better than some other people in the world. If you have not yet come to the place where you understand the Samaritan, this man who falls on the ground and expresses total dependence upon Jesus and thankfulness to him, I want you to hear again the very first words of the very first sermon that Jesus ever preached that we have recorded. The text says in Matthew, and opening his mouth, he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? I think you first have to understand what it means to be poor. Have you ever been around someone who's really poor? Years ago, about the time World War II ended, there was a great surge in the United States for mission work. People came back from the war. They visited other parts of the, of the world. 
They had seen the, the islands of the Pacific. They'd been in the, the, the different countries that were war ravaged in Europe. There was a great passion among people in America to go do mission work in other parts of the world. And it was during that time that an evangelist, feeling like he needed to understand what life was like in other places, decided to do a mission trip. And you know where he went? Juarez. <laughs> something we're familiar with. Right about the time this church started, he went over there to spend a week with a family, and he chose to go to the poorest of the poor areas. He stayed with a family for just a week, but every day he watched as a mother and father got up, not to go to work, but to go to the city garbage dump, to scour through the boxes of garbage that were dumped, looking for food to feed their children. I witnessed the same thing when I was in Guadalajara, Mexico several years ago. I watched young mothers with babes in arms and toddlers in tow tearing into plastic bags that people had dumped in the garbage looking for something to eat. It's horrible to be absolutely poor, to have nothing. Well, this evangelist, after spending a week in Guadalajara, continued doing what he did as an evangelist, going from place to place, church to church, bringing revival messages and stuff. And at the, after one particular revival time at a church, the church gifted him with a check, $6,000. Can you imagine what $6,000 was like in 1948 or whatever? That was a lot of money. And he was convicted. He knew what he needed to do with it. He sent the $6,000 to that family he had stayed with in Mexico. He immediately got back nine letters in two days. The father was so excited to tell him how he was using the money, how he was using the money to help his family and to help others in need. Do you get that? He was helping his family and others in need. What does a truly thankful heart do? A truly thankful heart expresses gratitude, and then shares the blessings. Some of the poorest people in the world are some of the most generous people in the world because they know what it means to be in need, and they'll always share what they have. We understand what it means to be poor. What does it mean to be poor in spirit that Jesus is talking about? It means to be bankrupt it means to be empty. It means that we stand before God with absolutely nothing to bring, to be worthless, to have nothing to offer to God because there's nothing in us worthy of God. And when we stand alone, empty-handed, before the gate of heaven, what happens? We find that that gate opens. And we come to know God as one who is filled with love and mercy for us. We bring nothing to God. We can bring nothing to God. But we find in God one who loves us and gives us his mercy and grace in his son Jesus. And it's as we are experiencing the love of God when we have nothing to give him. It is as we are experiencing God's love in Jesus that we can understand maybe for the first time in our lives that it's not about us. It's not about who we are or what we can do. It's not about our bloodline or our birthright. It's about God. It's about His heart and His love for us and His willingness to take we who are absolutely lost and make us His children. What did the Apostle Paul say? The verse you've probably heard me say a dozen times. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It is as we understand that we have nothing to offer God and yet God is there willing to give us everything that we can truly begin to understand what it means to have a thankful heart. It's not about us. It's always about God. But as we experience God's love and grace, as he showers his mercy upon us, we come to realize that his love is not just for us, 
It's for everyone, equally the same. You remember the passage uh, from John? Now, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he himself is the payment for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. If we are honest about what God reveals about himself in his word, we cannot help but rejoice because we find in everything God says to us that he is declaring that he loves us, that he wants us, and there is no price he is unwilling to pay to have us with him forever. That was the thankfulness revealed in the heart of the 10th leper, one who understood he was totally dependent upon the grace of God. And as he expressed himself in absolute dependence upon the grace of God, Jesus gave him everything. He was blessed with life and salvation. I want to close this morning with a story. Again, it's not often I find myself using two illustrations from the same era of history. But it's also during that time, immediately following World War II, when mission work was going crazy around the world. A doctor, having seen the horrors of war, having seen what the world was like outside the bounds of our country, decided he would go to India. He would go to India, and he would use his abilities as a medical doctor to heal people's physical bodies, but he would wanted to have the opportunity to tell them of God's love. He gets to India and finds that in the certain region of the country where he was, that many people were going blind and they couldn't figure out why. So he, as a doctor, begins to do research and stuff and finds that there is a disease that is causing blindness that's going through the population. And with a simple surgical procedure, he can repair their eyes so they won't go blind or that he can restore their sight. These are things that we've long found cures for over the years. The doctor begins to do these surgical procedures on the people's eyes, and their sight is restored. And after he's done hundreds of them, he comments, they never say thank you. It's because the words thank you don't appear in their dialect in India. They don't know the phrase. So instead, they would say a phrase that basically roughly translates, I will speak of your name. You see, they were so excited about what had been done for them that they would go out and speak of the name of the one who had restored their eyesight, the one who had given them the gift of sight back, the one who had blessed their lives. They would speak of his name. I want you to understand something. Every time we, as God's people, express our thankfulness, we are speaking God's name. The name of the God we believe in, the name of the God upon whom we are totally dependent and who in his grace welcomes us that way. We who are absolutely empty-handed and worthless, and yet he places the ultimate value and worth on us in his son. When we go forth in thankfulness, we are speaking his name the name of the God who loves us, the name of the God who saved us. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen.
I would just like to remind you that the Charge Conference begins at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall, and all members of the congregation will be